fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. Good morning and welcome to my Father's Place. We are looking at the books of First and Second Corinthians, and we are titling all of this to a church in crisis with love. And we have looked at some of the crises that are going on in the church, starting with the very first chapter. Now we are in chapter 12, and we are starting the 12th verse. And I will pray, and then we'll get into it. If I were going to give this a title, it would be, The Holy Spirit Unifies. So I'll pray. Father, thank you for your blessed Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you for the love you have given me for your church, that I would continue to call her back to you, that I would continue to call her to obey your command to be filled with your spirit. If we did not love her, you and I and the Father and the Spirit, we would just let her go, but we do love her. As we speak today, you through me, may that love be seen. Holy Spirit, glorify the Father and the Son. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to read down through a few verses at a time, I think, because there's a lot of discussion here that really needs to be taken apart as we go. And so, in verse 12 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, he begins with this, For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. What he means by that is so also is everything that is Christ's. If we are in Christ and Christ is in us, we are like my physical body. I have arms, I have legs, I have feet, I have hands, I have a head, I have eyes, ears, nose, mouth, but they're all part of Sue. In the same way, in the body of Christ, which is his church, we're all to be part of one unit that belongs to Christ. And so, they are, in Corinth, one church. They, are, they meet together. They fight together. They one-up each other together. But that is not the kind of unity that he is talking about. He is talking about unity of nature. If I have in me the divine nature, and you do, and Jeff does, and everyone else in a given church has his nature, there will be no schism. There will be no division. There will be no infighting. There will be no up one-upmanship. There will be none of those things. Those are all driven by the sin nature, which must be crucified if we belong to Christ. So, it happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why he commands the whole church to be filled. I cannot tell you, I have to digress just for a minute, cannot tell you how many times I have heard Christians say of the Holy Spirit, I don't need that. You surely need the Holy Spirit, and he is not a that, he's a him. <laughs> and you must have him fill you in order to be unified, as Paul is speaking of here. It's just as Jesus prayed in his prayer to the Father in John 17, starting with verse 22. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Remember, he's speaking things as if they are already done, but they are not yet done, not till Pentecost. 
The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. And in that passage, the glory is the full indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son, just as he promised in John 14, 23. That's when the unity comes. That's what he prayed for. So no Christian has any right to say, I don't need that. You surely do. I know I did. I know what I was like as a Christian before. And I know what I'm like now. And it's very different. He entirely changed my heart. Praise be to God. Nobody misses the old Sue. So, in verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Your initial sip is in view, and the ultimate, complete, overwhelming infilling of the Holy Spirit. There's one spirit, there's one body, and it doesn't make any difference what your station is, what your native country is. If you have his nature in you, you will be one with every other kind of human on the planet who is also filled with the Spirit. It's amazing. When you get together, even if you haven't seen each other for a long time, <laughs> there are some of my friends that live very far away from me now, it's like no time has passed. And we are just right in line with each other as far as What's the Lord been saying to you? Oh, yes, and me too, and this, you know, and it's wonderful, and we encourage each other, and this is the way it should be. Not a club, but just total unity in a way that only God can do. So, in 14, he says, For the body is not one member, but many. There's none of us who's better than anybody else, and he's getting to that, coming right up here. It isn't just that one person is the important one in the body of Christ. If that person is saying, I'm the only important one, then he's not filled with the Spirit and doesn't yet have the divine nature in him. He has the same problem that the disciples had in Luke 22, where they were talking about, arguing about who was the greatest. There is no greatest in the body. There is a hierarchy, and we'll get to that, that is there for God's purposes and according to God's will as far as offices. But even the very highest office holder in the church is no better than the one who does behind-the-scenes ministry. So, He begins to get to this issue in the church in Corinth in 15. He says, if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. So some people are feeling like, well, I'm not a hand, and a hand can do more than a foot, and so therefore I'm really not part of this body because they're telling me, because I'm not a hand, I'm not as valuable. And in 16, and if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. So again, some in the church at Corinth are saying, I'm better than you, because I have a greater gift, or I have more status. I, 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 I. How often do I hear that?
I am not a part of the body. It is not, for this reason, less a part of the body. You begin to think, oh man, I'm nothing. Nobody can use me. I might as well just sit in a corner. No, you're part of the body. I remember one time doing a message. <laughs> and it was about being there. You know, being at the church. We were doing a church plant at a university. And I told them that they needed to be there because they're all part of the body and we can't operate as a body without one another as long as we're unified by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so <laughs> I was hopping around on one foot saying, I don't know, Jane's not here today, but we'll just sort of manage to move along here in spite of it. <laughs> Everyone laughed. But... When you're filled with the Spirit and you're working in unity as a body, everyone filled, then everyone has a part to play. And if one is missing, there's a lot of hopping around going on. So no one's more important than the other, and all are needed. So if I, I just see that everywhere in the church today as much as in the church at Corinth, and I'm not saying this to be mean or judgmental or critical, but I'm just saying repent and ask the Lord to change your heart and fill you with his spirit because that is the only way that you'll get over your self-centeredness, which is what that is, and your pride, which is what that is. The disciples were delivered when they were filled with the Spirit at Pentecost. They were delivered of all those things. That's why I speak of being filled in every message. And I tell you it's a command in every message, not a suggestion. It's essential in order for you to all work together. Look how wonderfully the body worked together in the book of Acts. When Peter and John were arrested and came back and reported and everyone prayed together and, you know, it was just marvelous. And they had some people who were quickly identified as not having been filled, like Ananias and Sapphira. But they worked together as a body. No one thought they were better. He goes on to say of those who are being told or think they're nothing and not even really a part of the body. He goes on to say, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? You can't have one without the other. So everyone is essential in order for the body to work as it should. Everyone is essential. So, verse 18, but now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. So we don't get to tell anybody they're greater or lesser or anything because it's not us who even put them there. It's God. And so when you are in the church and you say, well, I think I would do this well or I think I would do that well, and you go and do that, pray first because you have to know where God wants you. You, in your own mind, may think you would serve well here or there, but God's the one who places you. And when he does, it's very good. And when you do, it can backfire. He does it just as he desires, just like earlier. The Holy Spirit gives just as he wills. In verse 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. But now God, in verse 18, has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired just as he wills, just as he desires. He, not us. 
If they were all one member, where would the body be? If we were all just a head or just an eye, we couldn't be a body. Everyone has a different role. God decides what role. Verse 20, but now there are many members, but one body. So there are many different offices, gifts, strengths in the church, in different people. But when we're filled with the Spirit, we operate as one, and by no other way. Verse 21, he's getting more specific with the church at Corinth, because some believers are making demarcations separating into categories and pigeonholing different members. Verse 21, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. In the natural, you can't be an eye and say, I don't need you hand. You need your hands to function. You can't, as the head, say to the feet, I don't need you. You've got to have some way to get around, don't you? And so, that's in a perfect situation. I know some people have lost limbs. Jeff lost a leg in Vietnam. But when we're talking about the body of Christ, we're saying that each part is needed. Each member, each body part is needed. In verse 22, he has just said, I have no need of you. I have no need of you. Paul says, on the contrary, you are wrong, O Corinthians, when you say, I have no need of this lesser part of the body. On the contrary, my NASB says it is much truer. And that's a really poor translation because there's no such thing as degrees of truth. One thing isn't truer than another. There is truth and there is that which is false. There is right and there is wrong. What it says in the original Greek to English is this. On the contrary, O Corinthians, who are making these demarcations, to a much greater degree, the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. They only seem to be weaker. They are essential. My little finger is not a very strong finger, but without it, I cannot play my guitar. I can't play the chords. So this may seem weak, but it's essential. Again, he's getting to the essentialness of all of us and the fact that the only way we can work together as we ought, each one of us being essential to the whole thing, is to be unified in nature. So, those which seem, by those who are looking down their nose, to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, God doesn't deem them that way, but we do, some of us, who are not filled with the Spirit and are saying they're better than others. We deem less honorable. On these we bestow more abundant honor. On these we bestow more abundant honor. We are to honor each other as equals in the body of Christ, but we will not do that until we are united in nature, until we have God's divine nature. And the sin nature, which is the source of all pride and one-upmanship, is destroyed. Hallelujah. Am I repeating myself? Yes. 
And then he says in the second half of 23, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. Our less beautiful, elegant members. My feet are beautiful (laughs) in that they carry the good news of Jesus Christ. But physically, they're ugly. But because they carry the good news of Jesus Christ, they are beautiful in God's eyes. So that kind of gives you a picture of what he's saying here. It's, they're not gorgeous. They're not elegant. They're nothing anyone could call beautiful. But they're essential. And in God's eyes, they are beautiful feet. And because we honor a feet, they become even more beautiful and elegant in God's sight. And in the sight of us who suddenly have changed hearts when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and say, oh my goodness, I'm looking at you through the eyes of Jesus. And I see that you are beautiful and elegant in his eyes. So, then, in verse 24, whereas our more presentable members have no need of this additional honoring, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. I want to tell you that I have a friend whose eyes are a little misaligned, and they, being misaligned, look a little strange, and she is not educated, but she's a prophetess. She's a prophetess, and she's an intercessor who knows what's going to happen to somebody before it happens and prays, and then later finds out that because she prayed, what was going to happen didn't happen. She looks like nothing. She has a twang. She's not educated, and she's got funny eyes. God honors her, bestowing that gift upon her for the benefit, for the common good. And for those who are filled with the Spirit, indeed, they do honor this woman because she's the real deal. The church at Corinth, some of the believers think they are more elegant and beautiful than others. They don't need anyone to tell them how great they are. They already think they are. But God has so composed the body. Who has composed the body? Not you, not me, not your church leader, not even your denomination. God has done it. God He keeps reminding them it's God, it's the Holy Spirit, it's according to their will. They do it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. Why? So that there be no division, no schism, no infighting, no one-upmanship, no pride. but so that we would all recognize each other as beautiful and elegant in the eyes of God and appreciate one another fully, not lifting up one over the other. That's schism. That's division. And God has given us ones that will be a test as to the condition of our hearts. If they look like my friend, 
and you welcome them and say, ah, you're a prophetess, then we are honoring the one that would otherwise be honored less. But that the members may have the same care for one another. And we're not just talking about empathy or sympathy. We're talking about the Holy Spirit depositing in you God's compassion and filling you to overflowing with his love. Romans 5.5 5, By the Holy Spirit. That we're talking about. My goodness. And then if one rejoices, we all rejoice. If one is honored, we are all rejoicing. All the members suffer with one who's suffering. You feel it. It's just as in Psalm 69, when Jesus is quoted in advance as saying, the reproaches which fall upon you, Father, fall upon me. I feel them in the same way that you do, Father, because we are one. And it is the same. I feel the same thing that God feels toward a church that is wayward and doesn't think she needs that when speaking of the Holy Spirit. Verse 27, he reminds them, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. He's in charge. He's your head. And it's to him that all glory and honor should ultimately go. He's the one that makes us beautiful and elegant. He's the one that places us here and there. And he's going to get to that in the very next verse. He's the one who does it. We don't choose. He places us. Verse 28, and God has appointed not us, in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. You see that there is that hierarchy I spoke of earlier, that apostles are over the whole thing, and prophets are the ones who get special words from God for the common good and for the guidance of the church. And then teachers. These are all offices to which people are appointed, not because we think it would be good to do, but we're appointed by God to them. And then he speaks of some of the gifts, then miracles. Gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. I'm going to go over to my notes because some people have a different view of what these things mean. So we have a hierarchy in the first three. This is how the church is set up. Apostles are at the top, then prophets than teachers, but none considers one greater than the other. It is simply to organize. Miracles are works that defy natural and scientific laws, things that only God can do. Gifts of healings, as I spoke in my last teaching, are many forms of healing, spiritual, physical, and many individual healings that someone with this gift is able to do in the power of God. Then helps is relief work. That is, those who go out proclaiming Jesus the whole way and provide food for the hungry and clothes for the naked. And then administrations, this is steering and directing in certain aspects of the church, 
not as an apostle, but as one who helps to steer and direct. The word comes from the apostle, and the, the one who has this gift steers the church in that direction and directs it. Then various kinds of tongues, beyond that which we experience when we are filled with the Spirit, and interpretation of tongues. Again, this is prophecy. When we are able to interpret, we will see it in chapter 14. All are not apostles, are they? That would be like saying all are eyes. All are not prophets, are they? All are hands? No. The body is comprised of many parts. All are not teachers, are they? The same idea. All are not workers of miracles, are they? No. Each one has a role assigned and appointed by God. Each one has a gift that the Holy Spirit gives as he wills. All do not, verse 30, all do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? That's why I specified beyond that which happens when you're filled with the Spirit, because everyone upon being filled will speak in either an unknown language or a prayer language. After that, that may be it. They may not have anything beyond that first moment. Not everybody has it. But everybody has something. Because God appoints every part of the body to have a function in the body. The Holy Spirit gives each one gifts. I don't say a gift because of the next verse, 31, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. So if you have a gift, the greater gift than tongues, which only you know what you're saying, and so you can't bless the rest of the body unless you have interpretation as well, which is prophecy. Earnestly desire the greater gifts, everything that you can possibly ask for. Ask for it. Eagerly desire it. And as he wills, and as he appoints, he will do it. He'll give you exactly what he wants you to have. But you should eagerly desire. However, in much of the church, they have a form of godliness that they abnegate and reject all of this to their own detriment. It's the body of Christ cannot work unless all of these things are working. Those churches, the Holy Spirit has left the building. Ichabod is written over their doors. The glory of the Lord has departed. This is the truth. But they go through all the motions and have the form. None of the power. That comes only from God and only by his Spirit and just according to what he wills. He closes out the second half of verse 31 with something tantalizing. And I show you a still more excellent way. A still more excellent way. A more excellent way then what you are doing, O Corinthian church, in one-upmanship and pride and putting down one and lifting up another, is an excellent 
way, a much more excellent way than the way that they are going. The next time that we meet, we'll talk about it. For a very long time in chapter 13. It's the most important mark that you have become unified in nature with Christ. You can tell by how you love. Lord Jesus, your church has swept your Holy Spirit to the side, and this offends you greatly, I pray she would repent from her turning away from this truth and the rest of the truths that she turns away from, that she would return to you, that she would not worship the world but you, you know, Lord, I warn because that's what you've set me to do. I warn out of the love you've poured out in my heart. Holy Spirit, send us out in your power, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit upon the land.